So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first in a planned series of webinars uh, updating you on companies that are part of the Quest Cap portfolio. Uh, the objective of these webinars is to allow you to hear directly from the companies and the institutions themselves. And just before we get started, I'd like to introduce Aaron Aiton. He's our corporate secretary and legal counsel to introduce our legal disclaimer. Aaron. Thanks, Doug. The purpose of this call is to give QuestCap's partners the opportunity to provide an update on their work. Select representatives from the MedQuest division will also make short presentations on their progress and answer questions from shareholders. The views, information, or opinions expressed by our partners are solely those of the individual presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of QuestCap and or its directors, officers, or employees. QuestCap is not responsible for and has not in all cases verified for accuracy any of the information be, to be provided by our partners on this call. Neither QuestCap nor its partners are making any express or implied claims that any of the research or products discussed on today's call have the ability to eliminate, cure, or contain COVID-19 or SARS-2 coronavirus at this time. During this call, QuestCap may make statements that contain forward-looking information within the meaning of applicable Canadian securities legislation. Forward-looking information will include, but is not limited to, state statements with respect to the potential of any of QuestCap's assets and investments, the ability of QuestCap to monetize on any of its investments, the pursuit by QuestCap of future investment opportunities, and the future financial and operating circumstances of QuestCap and its assets and investments. Forward-looking information is subject to known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors that may cause actual results to be materially different from the conclusions, forecasts, or projections expressed or implied by such forward-looking information. Certain material factors and assumptions have been applied in drawing the conclusions or making forecasts or projections reflected in the forward-looking information. A description of the factors that could affect and the assumptions underlying forward-looking information can be found in QuestCap's annual information form, financial statements and accompanying management discussion and analysis, as well as public disclosure documents that are available for your review under QuestCap's profile on CDAR. Participants should not place undue reliance on forward-looking information. QuestCap does not undertake to update any forward-looking information except in accordance with applicable securities laws. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, welcome everyone again. And in this first webinar uh, of a series that we plan to hold, we'll introduce you to four companies and institutions that are part of the MedQuest division partnerships. Uh, today we have presentations from some very esteemed guests, Dr. Samira Mubaraka of Toronto Sunnybrook Hospital Research Group for Emerging and Respiratory Viruses. Also joining us are Dr. Karen Colwell, and Dr. Darlene Hamanko from the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute at Mount Sinai Hospital here in Toronto. In addition, we have with us Mr. Reeve Benarin, the president of MTJR, the US and Canadian distributor for the PCL rapid gold antibody test, and the newest member in the MedQuest portfolio, Dr. Glenn Copeland of Glencoe. Before I turn it over to the presenters, I wanted to introduce myself. I haven't had the opportunity to meet uh, many of you, but uh, I wanted to just tell you who I am. I'm Doug Somerville. I'm CEO of QuestCap. I spent over 30 years in healthcare in both medical devices and pharmaceuticals. In early to mid 2000s, I served as vice president of Baxter's intravenous products division here in Canada before taking a global role as the global vice president for the medical device institution unit in, uh, in Chicago with the Baxter Healthcare Group. I left Baxter in 2005 and returned to a position in Canada with Teva, the world's largest generic drug manufacturer. I spent 13 years at Teva before retiring from Teva in March of 2018. For the last three and a half years of my 13 years, I was head of the Teva Canada Canadian subsidiary with IMS recorded gross sales of 1.3 billion. I was also chairman of the Canadian Generic Pharmaceutical Association. Since my retirement from Teva, I've worked with an Israeli-Canadian joint venture before joining QuestCap as CEO at the beginning of May this year. So nice to meet everyone. If it's uh, by this unusual webinar type of way, uh, we will do our best to hopefully have no technical glitches here, but uh, this is our first, so uh, cross our fingers, everything works well. Um, in the weeks since joining QuestCap, I focused on evaluating the current and future investments seeking out strategic fits to fund recognized sciences, technologies, and solutions 
that impact our global community across all three of our divisions, the MedQuest, ClimateQuest, and TechQuest tech divisions. Myself and our team use our knowledge and expertise to support our partner companies in, in attempts to expedite their success. And most of my, my immediate attention, attention has been on MedQuest and the technologies focused on the potential prevention, detection, and treatment of COVID-19 and the pandemic. We welcome questions to be submitted prior to the webinar, and we have some that we'll put to our, our presenters. And you can also submit questions during the webinar using the Q&A feature that you will see on your screen. Uh, we'll endeavor to answer as many questions as possible, and we will follow up with those that we can. not uh, The first question we've gotten, and I'll do my best to answer it, is what has happened to the share price? Uh, I can tell you we're focused on both short-term and long-term revenue opportunities. Our profit share partner, who we'll present shortly, MTJR, is currently generating revenue and distributing the PCL test kits to high complexity laboratories in the US. They also have orders in-house awaiting FDA emergency use authorization. Although we don't know the exact day that PCL will receive the EUA authorization, we do know that it's in review and that PCL's legal group are in conversation with the FDA reviewer. MTJR and PCL have the capacity to secure four to five million tests a month, a month at the present time and can increase this capacity if demand escalates. These orders should generate significant revenue short term and a profit share for QuestCap. Longer term, we're committed to the research programs we've, programs we've invested in, and you'll hear from two of those projects today. Our financial support of these research programs provides QuestCap with potential royalty payments on commercialization of products developed under these programs. We continue to look for additional opportunities to both address COVID issues, but also longer term potential beyond COVID. Our acquisition of 30% of Glencoe, just announced yesterday, is a good example of that type of investment that combines an answer to a serious need in the battle against COVID and a substantial business post-COVID crisis. One of the questions was, how will the new 30% purchase of Glencoe help Westcap? Glencoe is an injury, injury treatment company. It provides effective, non-invasive re remedies for inflammatory pain. Glencoe Medical acts as the exclusive distributor of CareWare. It's a wearable therapeutic class two low level light therapy device. Glencoe Medical through Dr. Glenn Copeland and the Glencoe Medical staff also has extensive experience and orthopedic knowledge from treating sports injuries and expertise establishing successful clinic operations, therapy protocols and outcome based practices. This is a growing field with the aging baby boomer population who are determined to stay active. Lenko also recently established the COVID-19 Standard for Safe Sport, Industry, School, Set, and Retail, through which it's developing and implementing protocols to safely return sports players, workers, students, performers, and shoppers to their prospective professions and passions. Dr. Copeland has been the face of protocol development and implementation and has been interviewed on radio, on TV, and in print across North America. The standard was designed by Dr. Copeland, who also serves as CEO of Glencoe, and will join QuestCap as chair of our medical advisory committee on the closing of the transaction. The standard comprises medical screening protocols for individual health safety. The screenings will incorporate temperature and symptom checks, in addition to testing for COVID-19 antibodies, along with interpretation, reporting, and contact tracing. Glencoe complements the testing capabilities of MTJR and PCL, and allows them together to promote, promote programs rather than just products. We have yet to find a better group that can create and execute important protocols that become an effective part of an overall solution. The transaction to acquire 30% of Glencoe has not yet closed and it is subject to customary closing conditions. With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Copeland to perhaps expand further on his background and the work at Glencoe. Dr. Copeland? Thanks, Doug. Um, a pleasure to be welcomed uh, into the QuestCap family. Um, my background um, back um, to uh, practicing in Toronto now for over 45 years. I've been on staff at Mount Sinai Hospital for 41 years. I was at Women's College for 22 of those 41 years. Um, to do a quick recap, um, I've been with the uh, Toronto Blue Jays as a consulting foot and ankle doc for um, since 1979. Uh, still there, uh, medical director of uh, Ottawa Sports and Entertainment Group. 
which is the Ottawa Red Blacks and the Ottawa 67s, um, and consultant to um, uh, Major League Baseball Atlanta Braves for the last uh, few years. Um, uh, my, my background in, in building businesses um, stems uh, back now probably 30 years. I built a company called uh, Footmax, uh, which uh, became a public company and uh, uh, left, uh, was uh, very successful. Um, in uh, 2001, I took the job as founder and CEO of Cleveland Clinic Canada. Um, and uh, built that out uh, and stayed a CEO till 2008 um, when I was uh, uh, conscripted by Mount Sinai Hospital to build the rehab and well-being slash sports medicine clinic, uh, which is um, uh, very active. Um, we started Glencoe uh, approximately 10 years ago. Um, and the basis of the whole program was looking at, at rehab medicine and looking at the, the most innovative ways that um, um, the amateur weekend warrior um, could rid themselves of, of these nagging injuries and get them back on the tennis court or the golf course and uh, the hockey rink. And um, our, our clinic um, at Mount Sinai and uh, a number of other clinics have proved to be very, very successful. Um, the the involvement with COVID um, was uh, quite frankly unexpected. Um, as as a you know, with a background in sports medicine, um, we we had a terrific immunologist by uh, the name of Dr. Larry Steinman, who also sits on the medical advisory board. Uh, Larry is uh, renowned in North America. Uh, he's a pediatric neurologist slash immunologist at Stanford. Uh, he heads up pediatric neurology um, at Stanford, and Larry uh, brings um, uh, an incredible base of uh, immunology to the table. Uh, what I brought to the table was uh, the workings of, um, uh, of what proteins need to keep the facilities that they work in as COVID-free as possible. Larry um, has, has brought his immunology skills and uh, his team uh, whether it's infectious disease, epidemiology, um, et cetera, to the table uh, to help guide uh, the protocols and procedures that we're using um, to, uh, to really lead in the safe return to safe sport and uh, uh, to business, to um, technology, and all the other programs that we've had. We've been consulted by 25, over 25 now, pro teams in North America and um, well over 25 internationally um, uh, to um, provide um, all the standards that we can. Uh, we've studied very closely and worked closely uh, with um, the leagues that have already returned, the German Soccer League, the Premier League there. We're working with the uh, Columbia Soccer League and um, uh, provided protocols for them to return. Um, we've looked at the Taiwan and South Korea baseball leagues and uh, worked with the doctors there. Um, and quite frankly, um, uh, what we're learning um, almost er every single day is um, the, uh, the success that the protocols have had. And so we're, we're excited with um, the potential of, um, of, of moving this forward with the right testing and the right procedures and protocols. And to be part of the QuestCap family to... Uh, uh, work closely with Doug and uh, see that we can um, open up as many facilities, um, whether it's sports or business, um, to allow the world to return to um, pre-COVID as safely as possible. So we're we're excited about the uh, potential of working with uh, the QuestCap family, and uh, we look forward to a long and uh, very fruitful, healthy relationship, Doug. Thanks a lot, Dr. Copeland. With that, I'm going to uh, turn things over to our first presenter. Um, this is Dr. Samira Mubaraka of Sunnybrook. And Dr. Mubaraka, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Wonderful. I will just um, share my screen here. I hope everyone can see that. Yes. Wonderful. Yes, we can. Let me just... Um, there we go. So thank you very much, uh, 
Doug and everybody, it's a real pleasure to be here with you um, this afternoon. Um, I think everybody appreciates how this virus has brought the world to its knees and people have been looking to science to solve some of the most challenging problems, um, really the, the problems that are really going to define our era, uh, unfortunately. And, um, you know, I think the response has been uh, unprecedented in terms of how rapidly and collaboratively science has moved. It's really moved at a frenetic pace, sometimes a little bit too frenetic, um, to be honest. Um, and anyway, we're trying to, to contribute our best and be as most impactful as we possibly can um, in this effort. So I'm going to tell you about uh, the Sunnybrook Translational Research Group for Emerging and Respiratory Viruses, which was established thanks to QuestCap. This, this group would not exist um, without QuestCap's contribution, and it came in the darkest, darkest hour. I remember that week, um, you know, the week that um, we had isolated the virus, but we're also starting to see cases uh, flow in from the community. And we admitted the first case in Canada here at Sunnybrook. And uh, I remember standing in the room at that time and thinking, okay, this is it. There's no turning back. It's here with us and it's here to stay. So we have to face it. So really face it, uh, we, we've had no choice. This is um, the one background slide I, I'm going to show because I think everybody is acutely aware of the numbers. Are millions of infections, uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths. And unfortunately, um, you know, uh, already we're starting to see a second wave in, in uh, Beijing. So uh, the end is um, still not quite in sight. Um, I'll tell you very briefly about myself, but and more importantly about the work that we've been doing. So I'm an infectious diseases physician. I practice here at, uh, at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. I'm also a microbiologist, a diagnostic microbiologist. So also based at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center is Shared Hospital Labs, which is a partnership of a number of labs uh, and hospitals in the north part of Toronto. And um, through a recent um, uh, joining of forces has now become probably one of the largest uh, hospital-based diagnostic microbiology labs in the province. Obviously, we work incredibly closely with our colleagues in infection prevention and control. Really, we're, we're what we call a community of practice. It's kind of hard to divide our labor because so many of us um, have roles and tasks in, in each of these er areas. But what I'm mainly going to be talking about today is my role as a virologist. So I'm, I'm, I'm a clinician scientist at the University of Toronto and at Sunnybrook Research Institute. And I'm going to focus, we're involved in quite a few activities, but I'm really going to focus on the ones that are supported by QuestCap. So predominantly genomics, medical countermeasures, and, and transmission. So this is what CERV looks like now. We're small, but we're mighty. Um, it's myself and Rob Kozak as faculty. Rob Kozak is also a virologist. He's what we call a clinical microbiologist. So he's not an MD, but he's a PhD trained microbiologist. Um, and he's not afraid to play with fire. He, he trained at the National Micro Lab and worked on Ebola there. Um, we each have our own respective uh, staff and obviously the key equipment to do uh, a lot of the basic work that we've started. Um, in terms of the facilities, we're predominantly based at Sunnybrook Research Institute, but we also have a foot constantly in the level three lab at the University of Toronto because we do work with the virus itself. So SARS coronavirus 2 is a level three pathogen. You can't work on it uh, in most laboratories. So our, our, that work is restricted to the CL3 at the University of Toronto. We are also not shy to step into the field. I'll tell you very briefly about what we've already done there. And obviously we couldn't do any of this without uh, some of our academic partners. We have many more than who I've listed here, but these are the, the groups that we tend to uh, interact with at least on a weekly basis, if not more often, and, and many, many more in addition to this. So very close collaborators with McMaster and the University of Guelph, particularly the Ontario Veterinary College. Uh, we work a lot with the National Microbiology Laboratory um, in Winnipeg, and I trained there as well at, uh, well, it's a long time ago now. Um, and I'll also tell you about the two genomics groups that, uh, that we're working with. So this all started really, I would say, uh, 10 years ago. So as a virologist, I had uh, trained at Mount Sinai in New York City in Peter Palacy's group and started focusing on influenza virus transmission. At that time, we developed a new model for influenza virus transmission. It was an animal model. 
Um, so that is the work that I brought uh, to Toronto when I came on faculty here. This work has expanded somewhat, um, not only from an experimental perspective, so we continue to do experimental work both at the bench as well as in vivo or with animal models, um, but also it's, it's expanded significantly into the field. Uh, it really is important to follow the virus if you really want to understand it. And knowing where viruses reside and how um, they have potential to spill over, it's important to actually think outside the, the species box. So we've, we've sampled uh, mosquitoes, we've sampled pigs, we've sampled bats. Uh, we go to farms, we go to caves, we go wherever we have to go. So we focus mainly on influenza virus. That's what I cut my teeth on. We were working on coronaviruses as well. Um, orthobioviruses are a group of uh, viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes. So those are what we call arboviruses. And we were uh, actually about to start our first field study on that this spring, um, obviously now delayed to the fall. Um, and rhinoviruses, the common cold virus, we had also been working on. In addition to this, because I'd been so focused on transmission uh, when I was at Mount Sinai in New York, started looking at bioaerosols, and that's uh, work that we continue to do here. We have a small bioaerosol lab in the biohazard suite here at Sunnybrook, obviously working with uh, risk group two pathogens, not three. So given that background, we had a lot of the tools in hand already when this pandemic hit to, to apply to the challenges that, uh, that we were faced with. And, and very fortunately, because we were already working in the level three lab at the University of Toronto with our bat samples, um, just out of uh, an abundance of caution. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we already had a permit and a license and, and uh, quickly gained permission to work on SARS coronavirus 2. So fairly early on, we were able to isolate the virus uh, in vivo. And this was an important step for us because you can't study the virus if you don't have the virus. Um, and this was very collaborative work, again, with McMaster and Aaron J. Banerjee. Uh, from there, we've, we've managed to make um, some significant progress. I'll highlight some of what we've done uh, in a second, but just as a brief overview, genomics has been a big part of what we've been doing. This is a, actually a genomic tool that was built with Vector Institute. We just published this in um, Lancet Digital Health last week. Um, so again, very cross-collaborative. You can't do genomics without computational biologists. And uh, we're very fortunate in Ontario to have a very, very strong group of computational biologists, both at University of Toronto, but McMaster as well. Um, we're also very lucky because you can only work in containment level three if you have people who are trained in containment level three, both Rob Kozak and myself are. Uh, we also managed to pinch a, uh, a tech from the bioterrorism group at, um, at the National Microbiology Lab. He had actually already been working with us on another project when the pandemic started. So he was already uh, trained and on staff with us. And we now have another postdoc who is coming uh, in maybe two weeks from the National Microbiology Lab where he has been working with SARS coronavirus 2 in the hamster model. So he will be joining us here at Sunnybrook and the University of Toronto. So we now have a pretty substantial number of personnel who can uh, work with this rather hot virus. Um, and one of the things that uh, I wanted to point out, because I think it's, even though it doesn't result in a publication or anything that uh, you, know, you can necessarily put on a CV, I think it's probably one of the things we're most proud of, um, and that's really sharing this virus. So, you know, the WHO very early on encouraged rapid, rapid and or open sharing of materials and data. We really took that to heart. So the virus that we isolated in containment level three at the University of Toronto is now either in the hands of or will be in the coming weeks to months of, of most uh, containment level three, academic containment level three labs in the country. So it's gone to BC, going to Calgary, or going to go to BC, Calgary, um, it's already at McMaster Western uh, McGill. And obviously, um, anyone else who has the means to work with it and request it, we will share. And we've shared a lot of other materials as well. So we've done over 20 material transfer agreements. And um, uh, in addition to this, we've been working um, with the, um, with the uh, Chief Science Advisor of Canada uh, and providing some support to the COVID-19, or I'm part of the COVID-19 
So I'll just very quickly move on in the interest of time here and just highlight a couple of the things, the activities we've been doing. So transmission, we've continued to work on, mainly through a study called Risk Copy with adults in the year. We have completed recruitment for um, the environmental exposure arm. So we're looking, we're doing bioaerosol sampling and surface sampling in the rooms of patients with COVID-19. Um, and we're analyzing those results. And we just this week initiated another um, uh, arm of that study that uh, looks at healthcare worker exposure during intubation. And some of this work has, has gained the attention of the Bank of Canada. So they've asked us to, to test their, their notes. And now the Mint is coming on board. We're going to, to look at uh, contamination of, of their material. Um, we've also been approached by public health in South Africa looking to help us um, do some assessment for their miners. They'd like to get their, their mines up and running again. So we will support that, that as well. We've um, established a simulation model we lovingly call Quarantino. And this is essentially a simulated ICU room uh, where we've been able to show, and we reported this to, to the WHO, um, what types of mechanical or non-mechanical or non-based ventilation are safest for healthcare workers. And again, this, this um, information and this data has, has gained some attention. So they're asking us to do the same in their air ambulances. So we're just doing that and we're working with Autodesk around modeling of this as well. In terms of genomics, um, we've been this has been a really key activity because of the substantial investment the Canadian government has made in genomics to ISEV, uh, $40 million investment. And uh, you know, even the though that Funding hasn't started um, moving yet. We've actually been able to contribute because we've had support from QuestCap. So we've already contributed a substantial number of um, whole genome sequences of the virus. This is just, this is from x stream This is not by any means all of our viruses. It's just to highlight um, the number of viruses and potential that are being contributed. And again, this is all open data. We do this to sequence and investigate outbreaks. Um, we do this to try to understand transmission, and we do this to try and identify targets for medical countermeasures. And this work has led to partnerships with uh, the Digital Supercluster and the Vector Institute as well. And then finally, medical countermeasures, probably the most important, but the most challenging and, and, uh, and, and, and tough area that uh, we're very, very committed to. Um, so antivirals and monoclonal antibodies have been uh, developed by collaborators and the plan is later this summer to actually start putting these into animals. Obviously the great limitations here is you know, we, need, we need the packs, we need, we need the animals, we need the facilities to do this work and it's coming, um, it's just take time. Um, we also have a number of vaccines that we're exploring, both myself and Dr. Koza. I'm not going to get into the details of exactly what these are, but we're trying three different uh, platforms because we are Robert platform agnostic, where it's the collaborators to really generate the material and then we offer to test it uh, in animals uh, in the containment level three facility. So again, another important advantage of actually having the virus in hand. We have a challenge virus that we can use uh, for its development. So obviously there's a lot that uh, needs to be done. We would like to expand in terms of faculty, in terms of space, in terms of equipment. Uh, that would allow us to expand in terms of collaborations and partners. And what we'd really like to do is establish a long range program that just doesn't end when the uh, clinical trials and the experiments are over. And really focus on preparedness and zoonosis. So I'm going to stop here because I'm pretty sure I've gone over time. And uh, I'd like to obviously acknowledge Westcap that um, Without them, again, none of this would have been possible. And especially Energy of Energy, who's here in the level three, uh, who's a key collaborator in terms of isolating the virus. So I'll stop sharing my screen at this stage. Doug, back to you. Hello. Um, just wanted to say thank you, first of all, to Dr. Mubaraka and the presentation. Uh, very interesting. We, have, we don't have a specific question for you right at this point in time, but we uh, will certainly answer anyone's questions uh, as they come in. 
what I'd like to do now is uh, turn the presentation over to Dr. Colwell and, uh, and the folks at Mount Sinai. Dr. Colwell? Okay. Okay, can everyone see that screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present our COVID-19 testing efforts that have been funded by QuestCap. I am the manager of the Network Biology Collaborative Center at the Linnefelt Tannenbaum Research Institute at Sinai Health System, and an initiative led by co-director Dr. Ann Claude Jingra. We have developed blood-based assays for detection and characterization of antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the causative agent of COVID-19. Using our automated platforms, we can screen up to 10,000 samples a day. This allows us to start addressing important questions that could help guide best practices as we move forward in the COVID-19 era. Seroprevalence studies, we can determine which individuals in a population have been previously exposed to the virus. To start understanding if past infection is seroprotective against reinfection, we can study immune correlates such as the type and quantity of antibodies that are being produced and how long immunity persists. Our current focus has been on building and validating our assays and obtaining samples to test. We have screened up to 2,300 samples in a day during this phase. Our detection assay is a simple plate-based ELISA, short for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, that uses 384 well plates. We coat the bottom of each well with a specific SARS-CoV-2 protein as an antigen. We then add plasma or serum from an individual. If they have antibodies that recognize the antigen, we will detect this using either a color-based or chemiluminescent-based readout. We have developed our assay using three different SARS-CoV-2 proteins that are known to be immunogenic. The first antigen is a spike protein that, uh, sorry, uh, that is responsible for viral entry into host cell by interacting with the ACE2 receptor. The second antigen is a fragment of the spike protein receptor binding domain that mediates this interaction with ACE2. We also test the nuclear capsid protein as an orthogonal antigen. In addition to testing three antigens, we also have the ability to test three different antibody isotypes. The IgM that appears early in response, IgG that appears as slightly delayed kinetics but is longer lasting, and IgA that is found in mucosal membranes such as in the throat and nose, the entry points of the virus into the body. To assess performance of a diagnostic assay, it is important to measure sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity measures the percentage of people who have had COVID-19 that are detected by our test, while specificity measures the percentage of people that have not been infected who test negative. One challenge in detecting prior infection in a population with low prevalence is the risk of overestimating positives if a test is not specific enough. In this example of 100 people with 10% prevalence, Blue represents individuals with no prior infection, and red represents those with active or prior COVID-19. With a sensitivity and specificity of 90%, there would be equal number of true and false positives as indicated by the plus signs. To assess our assay performance, we tested it using 340 samples from donors prior to the COVID-19 outbreak as true negatives and samples from 48 patients who have recovered from COVID-19 as presumed true positives. We use ROC curves to plot the sensitivity versus the one minus specificity at different cutoff values for detection. At the cutoff value we have chosen, we have 99% specificity and 96% sensitivity for the spike full length protein. An advantage we have over commercial kits is that we can test samples against all three antigens in parallel or sequentially using the spike protein as our primary assay and perform follow-up complementary tests with the other antigens. The likelihood of testing positive in all three assays and still being a false positive is much lower than for a single assay. A protective antibody is one that can neutralize the virus, thereby preventing infection. We expect the antibodies to the receptor binding domain that block its interaction with ACE2 would be neutralizing. The gold standard for defining neutralizing antibodies is the plaque reduction neutralization test that uses live virus to test if antibodies can prevent a virus from entering cells and causing the infection. 
This test requires biosafety level three containment and it is slow and cumbersome. This prevents it from being an effective screening tool in the early stages. We have developed a plate-based competition ELISA. The first two steps of the ELISA are the same, adding full length spike or its RBD to the plate and then adding plasma or serum from an individual. Purified labeled ACE2 receptors and ant added. If the signal is high, the antibodies do not block the interaction. The antibodies in the sample prevent binding of the labeled receptor. The signal is low, indicating neutralization potential. This is an example of two samples positive for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies that were tested against either the full link spike or the receptor binding domain in this assay. CBS50 plasma has neutralizing potential since the signal decreases as more um, plasma is added. CBS39 would be considered non-neutralizing because there is no signal decrease indicating that the antibody cannot displace ACE2 from, uh, from the receptor binding domain. We believe this assay has utility in several screening applications as a predictor of immunity in individuals once a link between antibodies blocking RBD and ACE2 interaction and seroprotection in humans is demonstrated. To evaluate the response of individuals to a vaccine is a high throughput screen for um, testing potential neutralizing antibodies as therapeutics and to help with the selection of blood donors for convalescent plasma therapy. COVID-19 is a new disease, so we do not yet know if prior infection will prevent reinfection, and if it does, how long immunity may last. We have just started longitudinal studies to track patients. Our current longitudinal data shown here is from hospital patients whose blood was taken soon after admission and a few weeks later after recovery. The light bars represent the early stage response to the three antigens at admission. Over several weeks, the patients developed develop antibodies to all three antigens, and this can be seen by the darker colored um, bars having a higher intensity. Our goal is to track cases of different severity, asymptomatic, mild, severe, over time to understand the strength of the immune response and how long the immunity may persist. Our automated platforms and the different tests that we have developed will give us the opportunity to assess zero prevalence and zero protection in a flexible and rigorous manner. The building and validating of this assay within the first three months after COVID-19 lockdown in mid-March has truly been a collaborative effort involving scientists across Canada, including Dr. Mubareka, um, who has provided clinical samples to test and also from scientists who have provided us with purified antigens. On our end, Anne Klojengra has led these efforts with Bavisha and Kento from her lab performing the test manually, Mary and Jenny um, establishing the automated testing. The funding has come from general grants to Anne Claude and to the NBCC, and more recently from COVID-19 specific funding, especially from CrestCap, which has been instrumental to us starting. Thank you, and I'm gonna just stop sharing the screen. I'll just unmute myself. Um, so Dr. Cole, a little a question that I, I know a lot of us have, and I don't I know that's probably the work you're trying to to get is that typically a virus uh, that the that a human body uh, you know, has and then recovers from forms a a period of immunity. Um, I assume that's the the measurement you're trying to get to on the last uh, work there is to any indications early on whether this is a longer or shorter term uh, potential immunity? It's still, I mean, we're still even just six months out from really the first case. So that's really hard to tell. From the original SARS-CoV virus, they know it lasted for several years after. And the and it's not as a mutagenic. Um, it's not changing its uh, DNA as quick as like the influenza viruses are. So there's hope, but there's not an answer yet. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for for the presentation and for bringing us up to date on what you're doing at, uh, at Mount Sinai. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn, the, uh, turn everything over to uh, Reeve. Uh, Reeve, 
Benaren is the president of MTJR. They are the distributor of the PCL test kits. And Reeve, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you have the floor. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate everyone being on this call. Uh, we, I'm the president of MTJR. MTJR has an agreement to exclusively distribute the PCL tests in North America. Uh, we have a phenomenal team. We're extremely happy of the uh, partnership that we have with QuestCap. Uh, we're also very, very confident of our ability to sell the tests. As Doug mentioned earlier on this call, uh, we expect capacity to be around 4 million tests per month, uh, the ability to sell those at um, uh, an average price of around $25. So we do see uh, future revenue to be very, very substantial and grow in the short, uh, in the short horizon. Uh, the team is, is comprised of, uh, uh, some, some really, really good, uh, solid people in terms of, uh, the, the setup. We have Mintronics logistics support. We have, uh, regulatory support, a gentleman by the name of John Sawyer, uh, realistic quality solutions. And uh, currently we are selling, as is approved, under the uh, FDA guidelines in the United States to high complexity labs. Uh, we do have an application in place with the US FDA and we anticipate uh, getting emergency use authorization approval uh, anytime uh, the, the reviewer has, has uh, provided us with, with pretty good guidance on that and uh, we're excited. Uh, in addition to that, and I think there was a question that was asked earlier on the call in terms of the submission to the application for Health Canada, and we are uh, happy to announce that uh, we have submitted the application to Health Canada through Tory's uh, Law Group, uh, which is a big law firm in, in Toronto, um, and that was submitted on May 20th of 2020. The uh, Health Canada reviewer came back to us earlier this week, Monday to be precise, with some additional follow-up questions, and we have submitted it back to them. So while they don't provide us with a specific timeline and approval, uh, we are excited and we are very hopeful that, that it, will be, it will be very soon. Uh, in terms of current sales, which is what I'm sure shareholders wanna know and, and investors wanna know, uh, we do have some sales currently we can sell in the United States to uh, CLIA high complexity laboratories and that's pursuant to the US FDA's policy on COVID-19 serological tests during the public health emergency period. Uh, so we continue to see orders trickling in only for high complexity labs at this point. We are currently FDA registered and can distribute legally to high complexity labs. Uh, at the same time, MTJR has current purchase agreements in-house that are conditional on the FDA approval, uh, somewhere to the tune of around 1.5 million units sold. So we do anticipate uh, off the bat the revenue to be very, very substantial the minute that we do get the approval. There are pre-orders that are in place, and we're really pleased with the progress and the interest that we've made on that. Uh, on the sales front as well. Uh, as Dr. Copeland mentioned, we have built protocols around getting professional sports teams back out on the field, back out playing. This is a very big deal that we've got these, these uh, partnerships in place. I think it's going to provide a lot of credibility and also give us the ability to really get this product heavily distributed throughout North America. That's, that's the update on, on the distribution part of it. Reeve, in terms of your clinical data, the PCL clinical data that was submitted to the FDA, can you give, um, I know it was uh, certainly, it was impressive data, but it, can you give an update in terms of the numbers and the, I mean, the two things that I always looked at when I looked at data in the medical device side is, first of all, how many patients were involved in the clinical study? Was it a large clinical study? The larger the study, the more uh, dependent you can get on the results. And um, if you can just share some highlights on that. Yeah, sure. So, so let me share some highlights on that uh, as well. Um, there was extensive clinical data. In, in fact, we've looked at, at others and we haven't seen anyone that's had as much 
there is 2,430 clinical patients uh, that have been tested, and it is rather impressive. Uh, the sensitivity was at 91%, and the specificity was at 99%. Uh, and um, that, uh, that, that was, those were the results on that. Okay. Um, in terms of right now, you, you mentioned about the revenue you can sell currently to high complexity labs under the CLIA uh, on, based on your current FDA registration. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will expand uh, to high and moderate, I believe, as soon as you receive um, the emergency use authorization. Correct. So that, that the emergency use authorization uh, with the US FDA allows us to then sell to medium complexity laboratories, which would include uh, most of the healthcare space, certainly urgent cares, et cetera, uh, and or partner with laboratories, medium complexity laboratories. In the case that we really see corporations and society getting back on track, we're gonna have partnerships in place with labs. Of course, we are also pursuing a point of care approval and point of care approval, which we hope uh, in the coming months to obtain, is going to give us uh, the ability to partner with the likes of CVS and other major drug stores as well, uh, where we're really gonna see an increase, a major substantial increase in, in demand and in revenue. Okay, great. Reva, I appreciate that. Uh, I thank you for the update. Thank you, uh, everyone. appreciate it. With that, it's, uh, it's coming up on just a little bit uh, before five. Uh, we have uh, had an opportunity to listen to the three presenters, and thank you very much, all three of you, for, uh, for presenting what you had today. We will, as I mentioned, have a number of additional um, webinars over the time and introduce a other of the group of companies that are currently a part of the QuestCap team, but also companies that may become uh, part of the team in the future. And um, so, once again, appreciate everyone's attendance. Uh, we, whatever questions we haven't gotten to in the time frame, we will certainly uh, get back specifically and answer. But uh, we want to again thank everyone for what you've uh, what you've uh, done to participate, and um, you'll hear from us very shortly. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate the call.